In at number five, we have Medusa. Medusa was one of the three Gorgon sisters along with Stetno and Euralee. They were the children of the ancient deities Foxis and his sister Seto. Their parents were Sothonic monsters from an archaic world. Her appearance is that of a winged human female. In the place of her, she had living venomous snakes. The legend goes that if you were to look directly into Medusa's eyes, you would be instantly turned to stone. This made Medusa terrifying and fatal to many who tried to attack or even look upon her. She was an extremely beautiful woman as a way to incite people to look upon her beauty and be cursed by her eyes. This curse is not something that she chose, it's actually said that she was the unfortunate victim being cursed with this power. Medusa was cursed when she had an unwilling relationship with Poseidon. Even though she didn't want any relationship with him, the fact that it happened was enough for Athena to be enraged and curse her. She didn't want her to have any lovers for as long as she lived, so anyone who would gaze on her beauty would themselves be cursed. Due to her curse, she was feared and many tried to kill her due to it. She was often approached with the intention to take her out, but they would fall from the curse before they had the chance. This was until she was beheaded by Perseus. He was hailed a hero and brought the head to King Polydectes. He was given help from the gods to take her life. Even beheaded, she held great power and her head was used against their enemies in wars following this. Medusa's life was full of suffering, none of which was intentional on her part, but she suffered the most due to this. Even though it was not her doing, it's a good thing she is not real. If you could turn to stone just by accidentally looking at her, I think there would be a lot of people turned to stone by her today. Number 4. Desire from Neil Gaiman's The Sandman A strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. Desire is the anthropomorphic personification of its name. It is quite possibly the most destructive human emotion because it can be so easily warped and manipulated. Desire can lead people to commit heinous acts at the drop of a hat, and often it is never fulfilled in a way that is satisfying. There are so many things that can go wrong once one begins to desire or covet. Where I touch, things want and need and love, drawn to their objects of desire like butterflies to a candle flame. Despair can take the form of a gorgeous, gender mutable figure who can change form to fit in whatever situation it finds itself in. It's always the pretty ones that cause trouble. Desire is described as being of medium height, it's smelling a bit like peaches. Its smiles are brief and sharp, its skin is pale as smoke, and its eyes are tawny and sharp as yellow wine. It has two shadows, one black and sharp, the other translucent and wavering. Within the Sandman mythos, Desire is the most casually cruel of the Endless. Forever meddling in the affairs of its siblings, it constantly acts without considering the consequences of its actions. Much meddling results in dire consequences, and at many points these consequences could have almost world-shattering results. This flippant behavior from one graced with the powers of the Endless is hugely horrifying because it can cause so much to go wrong with seemingly no meaning. Again, it's the human touch that makes this so scary. We discussed another one of the endless, despair, in our last video and found out plenty about what makes a being like that so terrifying. However, it's hard to imagine despair even existing without first the existence of desire. It's an interesting proposition. Can one feel despair without ever knowing what they desire? Coming in at number three, we have Apophis. Apophis was the ancient Egyptian deity of chaos, the opponent to the sun god Re. His appearance is that of a giant serpent. He stretched 16 yards in length and his head was made of flint. Each night as the sun set, it's said that Apophis would wait for Ray on the horizon and they would have a battle. Although Apophis would fall, he would never be permanently subdued and would return each night to try and stop Ray's nightfall ritual. Apophis was never worshipped by the Egyptians like Ray, but instead worshipped against. In an annual ceremony named Banishing of Apophis, a priest would build a box thought to contain all the evil of Apophis and then burn it. The people would then be saved from his influence for another year. The Egyptians even wrote a detailed book on how to defeat the evil gods named the Books of Overthrowing a Pep. A pep being another name given to the creature. The book went into detail on how to dismember and dispose of the great snake. The book even contained instructions on how to create a wax model of Apophis that you could destroy during the nightly battle as a way to aid Ray. It is believed that you needed to protect yourself from Apophis once you had passed on. Since he lived in the underworld, your soul needed protection past the living realm. In the Book of the Dead, there are multiple spells on how to destroy Apophis once you were dead. They covered every base so that you were prepared to face the serpent no matter what. 
Coming in at number two, we have Hel. Hel is the daughter to Loki and resides over a realm of the underworld of the same name. She was given this responsibility of ruling by Odin. She is a half blue and half flesh coloured being. It is said she gets a portion of souls in the underworld to rule over and torture as she sees fit. Hel is described as being rather greedy, harsh and cruel. She shows indifference when it comes to the suffering of both the living and the dead. She has many powers at her disposal for being cruel in the underworld. These include age acceleration, disease manipulation, necromancy and even the kiss of death. These powers were not just confined to her realm and if she were to come to the mortal world she could use them to create chaos here. It is said she can also sometimes shapeshift like her father, something that can be very dangerous. She has been known to walk in disguise to get unfortunate victims bewitched by her beauty just to use the kiss of death to bring them to the corner of hell for further torture. There have been depictions of hell in today's media. The character of Hela from Thor Ragnarok is based on hell's Greek mythology. And as you saw from that depiction, she was cruel and powerful, proving almost unstoppable. Also, she was gorgeous, because Kate Blanchett. I love Hela. She's the hero of Thor Ragnarok. And finally coming in at number one we have Lilith. Lilith is a she-demon once mythological god. Lilith was Adam's first wife. She was made from the same clay as him. Once on earth she didn't understand why she had to be subservient to him when they were created as equals. Facts Lilith. Facts. She made the choice to leave the Garden of Eden. Once she left, Eve was created to take her place and to serve Adam. Lilith left the garden she walked for a long time, maybe even years, until she was found by the Archangel Samael, who we now know went on to become Satan. They quickly fell in love and created a place for themselves to live. He had a large influence on Lilith and is the reason she turned to being a demon. She quickly became more and more powerful. Samael left Lilith due to his own greed. She began to grow distaste for men. She gave birth to Samael's children and was then called the mother of all demons. She was also named the Queen of Hell. Her children named Lilithu were winged sprites who had a tendency to be cruel and violent in nature. It was said they would attack men for their greed. She'd use them as a vessel to get her revenge on what had happened to her. She wanted to punish male greed and their need for power over women like her. Some say she wanted to take down Satan and take his place for herself, but other texts have them ruling together in harmony, and even some say they were married. Lilith is immortal as long with her many other powers, meaning if she were real, she could be among us today. She can take any form she likes with her shapeshifting. She is also able to cast spells along with her own telekinesis. In modern media, she is also shown as using voodoo to control people to do her bidding as she wished. She is cunning and likes to use others to get what she wants. That way, she does not put herself in danger in any way. If she was alive today, she would be right behind the feminism movement. Kicking off at number five, a pep. And it's important to note that Egyptian mythology is incredibly vast and journeyed, and its creation myths stretch far and wide. One of the most important gods in ancient Egypt was Ra, creator of the sky, the earth and the underworld, and the bringer of light. But of course, you can't have light without the dark, so enter this guy, Apep, the ancient Egyptian embodiment of chaos and the one true opponent of the forces of good. Also known as Apophis or Apoph, this chaotic deity often appeared in the form of a giant serpent, and his only true purpose was to bring torment and ruin to Ra in an endless battle of blood and chaos. I mean, there aren't many grey areas in this particular mythos, Apep is literally the embodiment of all evil, but it's in the great lengths that the ancient Egyptians went to to combat this guy where the grisly nature of Apep can reveal just exactly how strongly they feared him. Apep was thought to encompass the world, wrapping his coiled body around the planet just below the horizon, lurking within the lands of the dead and the underworld. To combat him, Egyptian priests would create wax models of serpents, or in in many cases actually hoard live snakes and tear them to pieces in a ritualistic act of mutilation, burning their bodies in the thousands. They feared him so much that they'd carve protective spells into their dead so that when they awoke in the underworld they'd have a fighting chance against the evil of a pep. That's dedication. Coming in next at number 4, Hades. Because really, in all reality, we can't talk about any kind of lord of the underworld without giving credit to the true guy who hails downstairs. Hades. And no, not the James Woods version. Because black robes and flaming blue hair aside, Hades was actually a terrifying deity in Greek mythology, so much so that the ancient Greeks even feared to speak his true name. In fact, compared to other Greek gods, little was recorded about Hades, as the ancient Greeks were terrified of marking his image in fear of attracting his attention. When offering up sacrifices to him, the Greeks would cover their faces or perform the ceremony with their eyes closed in fear of catching his gaze. There are also several stark connections to a death cult connection to Hades, a secret sect of worshippers that believe that Dionysus, 
The god of wine and revelry was actually the youthful form of Hades, and in the lustful practice of gluttony and indulgence, they were actually worshipping the lord of all death. Hades is an incredibly interesting figure in Greek mythology, and yet despite his terrifying reputation, he was also a pretty just and fair figure that would often give mortals the benefit of the doubt when staring down their immortal death. Or maybe he was just doing that for kicks. Yeah, it was probably that. Next up, our number three is Anami. And for this entry, we're going over to Japanese mythology and the creation myths of the Shinto religion. Shinto is a practice of duality, of both life and death, all of which is encapsulated in the goddess Izanami no Mikoto, which means she who invites, which is a little disconcerting already, isn't it? In Japanese mythology, Izanami is the goddess of both creation and death, and she began her reign as the wife of the creation god Izanagi, where she gave birth to the many deities of Shintoism. But it's in the tale of her final birth where the horror of Izanami truly got turned up a notch. After dying during childbirth whilst giving life to the deities of the incarnations of fire, Izanami was buried in a tomb and her essence was transferred to Yomi, the shadowy land of the dead. Enraged by her death, her husband Izanagi journeyed to the underworld to find her, but couldn't as the encroaching shadows hid her appearance. She spoke to him from behind the veil, telling Izanagi that she had already eaten the food of the underworld and couldn't leave. Izanagi straight up refused to accept this and swore never to to leave her, but as he struck up a torch, the light revealed the truth of Izanami. The once beautiful and graceful form of Izanami had turned into a husk of rotting flesh with maggots and foul creatures crawling over her ravaged body. Well, as you would, her husband decided to get the hell out of Dodge, but Izanami chased after him, shrieking and cursing him for leaving her. She was so furious that she swore to reap 1,000 souls a day just to spite her previous love. Well, Izanagi replied that he would give birth to 15 hundred. What a comeback. Coming in at number two, Nick Nevin. I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty biased on this one, but much like the Morrigan from our previous part one, and despite her horrifying depiction, Nick Nevin is pretty damn awesome, if not the very meaning of a nightmare to those that have wronged her and her many enemies throughout mythology. Derived from the garlic surname Nick Naven, meaning daughter of the little saint, Nick Nevin is a bloodthirsty queen of the fairies in Scottish folklore. She is principally related to the Irish and Scottish Fela Nemab, the festival of the dead, which is otherwise tied to Samhain, the Celtic New Year, and the darker half of the solstice. The fact of the matter is, Nick Nevin is a name often tied up to depict the seminal mother witch, and in Samhain, her name was given amongst other powerful female deities, Satya, Bensoja, Zobania, Abundia, and Hero Diana, and is thus tied in with the various practitioners of necromancy and sorcery in Celtic mythology. As the renowned poet and author Sir Walter Scott described, Nick Nevin rode on the storm and marshaled a rambling home host of wanderers beneath her grim banner. She was a hag that rode at the head of witches, sorceresses, and elves indifferently, always emerging upon the ghostly eve of All Hallows Mass. Now, as I said at the opening of this video, modern religion gave the old ways an incredibly bad image, and because of that, Nick Nevin was said to be ferociously angered by her newfound enemies. But as the legendary Scottish folklorist Alexander Montgomery said, the elder Nick Nevin regularly feasted upon the flesh of holy men. And finally coming in, and finally coming in at number one spot, Chernobog. And this guy is so damn mysterious that scholars are still arguing to this day as to his true motivations in Slavic mythology. In many Eurasian proto-religions, the concept of dualism was a key theme, with light and darkness being two clear opposing forces, but were also given the same sense of worship and importance in their ritualistic understanding. Bilobog, also known as the Light God, was held as the progenitor of all things good in the world. But in contrast, his counterpart, Chernobog, the Dark God, was seen as the orchestrator of all things bad and terrible and responsible for mortal misfortune. Now, this dualistic theme is what makes Slavic paganism so damn interesting, but nevertheless, Chernobog always lived up to his name and was ritualistically portrayed as grotesque, intimidating, and accursed. But nevertheless, Chernobog always lived up to his name and was ritualistically portrayed as grotesque, intimidating, and accursed, a monstrous figure that need only utter a few curses to bring complete folly to mankind. 
It is in the fear of the unknown where the terrifying potential of Chernobog truly lies. But there's actually a quiet sense of comfort in the Slavic worship of the Dark God. As the Germanic priest and scribe Halmod of Basau wrote, during Slavic ritualistic feasts to appease their pantheon of gods, a bowl of potent spirits were passed around and each person would utter the names of their gods, Bilobog, but most importantly also Chernobog. And it was of the utmost importance never to leave the name of the bad god out in fear of attracting the attention of his mortal misfortune. You've got to take the rough with the smooth, after all. In at number 5 we have Loki. Loki was the trickster god and is known to sometimes be helpful to the gods but simultaneously more often than not causing as many problems as possible on purpose. Besides this fact Loki has always been identified as a trickster and shapeshifter and used his powers to cause chaos. Being the son of two giants he was accepted by the gods of Asgard but early on Loki proved himself a troublemaker for his ability to shapeshift, using this power to trick the people around him, causing him to be known as a god of mischief and causing trouble purely for his own amusement. Loki's mischievous ways stood front and center in this trickster's story. Loki has been described as a syringe, alluring and frightening figure who is unreliable, moody and a trickster. Don't take his trickery for granted though as he was always very intelligent and sly, thus being able to use his shapeshifting abilities in malicious ways. Loki's main attribute was his wit. He rarely engaged in physical combat and for that reason carried no weapons on him, as he only needed to rely on this strong wit to get him out of situations. The Greek god was always seen as more of a burden than a help to other gods and goddesses and for his trickery, causing chaos among people for his enjoyment and surviving the fallout of his pranks thanks to his wit and intelligence. Swinging in at number 4, Despair. The Sandman. And you know what? We could have certainly featured the actual main character of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman on this list. The dream sleeping, swagger walking, chain smoking, coffee fiend himself, Dream aka Morpheus if you're feeling adventurous. Because as a side note, for a protagonist, Dream does some pretty messed up stuff in that brilliant graphic novel series and kind of ends his reign by just killing everyone. Sort of. He certainly commits a few murders along the way, but whatever. For the sake of brevity, we'll give Dream the benefit of the doubt and instead we'll cast our gaze toward his equally perplexing and utterly bone chilling counterpart, Despair. One of them, anyway. As is written in Endless Nights, the follow up to the Sandman series, and one that fully fleshes out the pantheon of the Endless, take away the despair and there is nothing left. Nothing but an empty room and a hook of the perfect shape and size for snagging at your heart. Despair most often appears as a short, naked, grey, and rotund woman with sharp, pointed teeth and greasy black hair tied in a bun. She demonstrates no odour, but allegedly her shadow has often been described as smelling musky and pungent like the skin of a snake. Her sigil is a hooked ring which she only wears on her left hand and haphazardly uses it to tear into her own flesh absentmindedly, which yeah, that's one of the reasons she's making this list really. You see, in Despair's realm, in stark comparison to the wild and whimsical realm of the dreaming that Morpheus rules over, is instead a grey and foggy space filled with endless skittering rats and mirrors used for looking upon people in the depths of their own despair. You see, what is strange is that Despair is said to be one of the few endless that have seen two incarnations. It isn't clear as to how she was initially destroyed and reformed, but this one is certainly a bleak and bewildering replacement. Compared to all of the other Endless who are clear in their emotional personifications, Despair is a tough one to In at number 3 we have Apollo. At first Apollo seems like a friendly and lovable god, but then you get to know him. Being the god of arts and protector of humankind and is the son of Zeus and Leto. Apollo was notorious for his uncontrollable temper, a trait he undoubtedly got passed down from his father. Apollo can be described as one of the scariest mythical gods in history because if he was having a bad day, Apollo was known for his irrational use of his power when giving out punishments. As an example, Apollo would throw punishments of the plague and illnesses around into the Greek camp during the Trojan War, causing people to fall ill. Like father, like son, Apollo took a lot of qualities from his father, including being a harsh punisher to anyone that crosses him in the wrong way. He would punish women who got in the way of his advances by turning his lovers into plants. Additionally, Cassandra, daughter of King Priam, and Queen Hecuba of Troy suffered one of the worst punishments for refusing Apollo's advances, as Apollo gave her the ability to see the future but only the tragedies and no one could believe her. Thus with his deceiving personality and irrational punishments, he was doomed from birth to embody qualities taken from his father Zeus. Apollo's darker side had him being arrogant and narcissistic, and often disregarding the feelings and wishes of others. He seemed to not care about anyone other than himself, and punish women when they rejected 
trusted him. For his sheer disregard for other people's emotions and only caring about his own, he gets a spot on the list. In at number 2 we have Aphrodite. Being the Greek goddess of love, beauty and sexuality, one could only assume the scary amount of power that Aphrodite holds by being the goddess of temptation and sexual desires. Her parents being Zeus and Dion, Aphrodite worried her father about her sexual wanderings, forcing her to marry the god Hephaestus against her will. Hephaestus was an unattractive man who forged weapons for the gods. Understandably, Aphrodite was less than pleased with this arrangement, which arguably was the start of her villain origin story. She began to have many affairs and became unfaithful to her husband. Her vanity led her to become a cruel goddess, especially to those who would dismiss her. An example of this can be seen when Hippolytus chose to worship Artemis instead of Aphrodite, causing Aphrodite to rage in jealousy and cursed his mother and ruining Hippolytus' family. Aphrodite let her vanity get the better of her and punished anyone who dared to neglect her or what she stood for. The goddess's ways of getting back at people who didn't worship her were cunning, often involving other gods and even mortals, without sparing their feelings or lives. With punishments ranging from being turned into an animal and being accused of heinous acts, Aphrodite was anything but forgiving when it came to those who double crossed her. People and gods alike feared her for this reason, as the goddess's wrath and power could inflame them with unnatural passions. Her biggest strength was the ability to make men fall in love with her, causing men to to do unearthly things to get on her good side. Thus, Aphrodite was more than just love and beauty, but had a darker side to her that was fueled by her true wrath of vanity, jealousy, and bad temper. Being the goddess of one of the strongest human emotions, Aphrodite has a great power over the people around her. Especially since this dark side of Aphrodite is masked by her beauty, she can be considered one of the scariest mythical gods in history. And finally, in at number one, we have Zeus. Being the king of the gods and god of thunder in the sky, we simply cannot leave Zeus off of this list. Arguably, one of the most powerful and intelligent mythical gods in history, as he is known to be very wicked, a liar and a cheater, especially when it comes to tricking women. We can see his sheer lack of morals and empathy when beginning his reign, as Zeus had to overthrow his own father, Cronus, and once Zeus reached adulthood, he banished Cronus to pieces. You won't want to get on his bad side, as he would harshly punish those who acted against his will. Zeus was known to have a cruel side to him, especially to people who didn't align with him. When it comes to his ruthless punishment against those who disagreed with him, a prime example is strapping Prometheus to a rock while an eagle ate his liver daily, only for the liver to regrow, thus an eternity of torture. He did this because Prometheus was caught stealing fire from Olympus. He was also known to have a superiority complex towards humans, causing him to act cruelly to them if they ever tried to ignore him. Zeus was an upholder of the universal order and in charge of punishing oathbreakers, liars and violators. His actions were questionable and immoral most of the time, and even though he was known to enact justice among the gods, his ego and great amount of power had him lacking any sort of empathy. The Greeks had a strong belief that power outweighs any sort of sensible personality traits, and therefore even though Zeus had immoral ways of acting, he was worshipped, and never questioned for his actions. Because of this, he used his power in malicious ways when someone acted against him. Being violent, insatiable, and insensitive god, Zeus undeniably earns the top spot on our list. Number four. Five on this list is Enyo. Enyo was the Greek goddess of war and destruction. She was the companion and lover to the other god of war, Ares. Enyo was sometimes depicted as being the child to Zeus and Hera, which also makes her the sister to Ares. Enyo is noted as being extremely destructive, which ties very closely to what she is, the god of destruction. Enyo isn't nearly as well known as Ares, but the little that we do know about her leads people to believe that her bloodlust was almost unrivaled. She apparently liked to incite as much chaos as possible, death and murder bringing her a large amount of joy. She was an extremely skilled fighter as well and would often enter the fray and slice people down with ease. Her fighting skills are considered to be only second to Ares himself. So if you ever did piss her off, then that would likely be the last thing that you do. She was also instrumental in the Great War of Troy and played a large part in facilitating and inciting much of the bloodshed that occurred during that fight. Apparently, she also brought war to the Philippines as well. Not only does her fighting prowess scare me, but what worries me the most about her is her deep love of terror. All of the research that I did on her kept citing that she was a lover of terror and pain. She seems like the type of Greek goddess who would incite a major conflict that could kill thousands just simply because she was bored or to gain pleasure out of it. Definitely not the type of god that you'd want to get on the wrong side of. Coming in at Fort Yidra, to quote John Paul chat in Where Yidra Walks, a hundred April winds disperse her fragrance, a thousand wet October scour her foot 
footprints. The ruthless years assail the ancient memory of her presence, yet where Yidra walks the hill do not forget. Yidra is an outer god who is worshipped as a beautiful, awesome and terrible earth monster similar to Shubna Garath, and might be connected to the darkness, but more on her later. She has many avatar forms including Yolanda and Madame Yi, since her life cycle centers around absorbing other life forms and taking from their evolutionary advantages. This in turn makes her immortal. She has telepathic powers which give her a link to the servitors and can reject illusions. Back to her avatars though, as I mentioned one of her avatars is Madame Yi in which she appears as a beautiful human Asian female dressed in billowing red, white and black robes, which has a delicate painted face that looks like that of a porcelain doll and possesses razor-like long fingernails. The avatar appears in China where it mates with and kills the young men provided to her by a female-led and dominated cults, producing monstrous or deformed offspring, most of which are reabsorbed by her. Number three on this list is Kronos. Kronos is technically considered a titan, but I'm going to allow it for this video. He was the son of Gaia and Uranus and is one of the most powerful beings in all of Greek mythology. In fact, his power is so vast that he was the one who fathered three of the most known Greek gods, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. He ruled over the world for some time, but before he did that, he's noted as doing a brutal act. In Greek mythology, it goes that Kronos murdered his own father, but to do it, he took a sickle and castrated his dad, and then threw his father's remains into the sea. All of that is very questionable and makes me a tad bit scared of him to begin with, but his vast power is what frightens me the most. Kronos was eventually defeated by his sons, but it took all of their strength to make it happen. He's the god of time and can manipulate it at will. A power like this is almost too strong for any individual to have, even if they are a god. Eventually, Zeus imprisoned his father in the depths of Tartarus, where he should still remain. For the world to prosper under Zeus, Kronos had to be sent away. This scares me as well because if Kronos ever was to break free from his prison, then his wrath would be vast beyond our knowing, and the world would likely cease to exist. Number two on this list is Hades. This wouldn't be a complete list if we didn't talk about the god of the Greek underworld himself. The god of death, to my understanding, wasn't inherently evil at his core. Many people depict death as being an evil thing, and those who facilitate said death to have that characteristic in them. Hades wasn't this way though. He cared for the balance of life as a whole, and understood that death was necessary in maintaining that balance. Just because he wasn't evil though doesn't Mean we shouldn't fear him. He was cold and stern and unwavering when it came to his position. We also need to remember that he was the god of the underworld, Greece's version of hell. Leaving this place was a big no-no for Hades. He strictly forbade anyone from ever leaving the confines of this underworld and would become extremely enraged if anyone attempted this. His wrath would also know no bounds for those who tried to cheat death or cross him. Legend goes that Pyrithuus tried to kidnap and wed Hades' wife Persephone. Hades discovered of this plan and tricked him into coming to a feast. Once there, snakes wrapped around his feet and kept him captive until Hades was through with him. Then he was fed to his hound, Cerebrus, a three-headed dog which is by Hades' side at all times and acts as a gatekeeper to the underworld. Along with the fact that Hades can be quite brutal if you ever attempt to cross him, he is also incredibly intelligent as well. There's many a story of Hades outsmarting other gods and getting his way. This intelligence coupled with his immense power and and the fact that he's the actual god of death makes it clear that he's one of the scariest Greek gods to ever exist. Number one on this list is Moros. Moros was a pre-mortal deity and is the offspring of Nyx. It's said that Nyx conceived him without any male intervention at all. However, some experts on the subject dispute this, saying that Erebus, the god of darkness, was the father. Moros was feared by all. Even Zeus was reportedly afraid of the ability that this Greek deity possessed. The website Greek Boston has a great article talking about how inherently powerful Moros was, and I'm going to quote that now. Moros was powerful. Powerful, so he couldn't just be taken down by another god. He would always find a way to bring misfortune to his impending victims. He was called by the people and the other gods, the all-destroying god. Even after his victim died and went to live in death, he did not set them free. He decided to make sure they suffered. He's not only seen as the god of death, but also the god of death and suffering. His name is near to Moros, meaning sullen and 
ill-tempered near to the spirit of depression. So that passage gives you an idea of the temperament of this god, but it doesn't explain his ability, and his ability is what scares me most of all. Moros would literally decide your fate of death. He would write it out and then give it to his brother to make sure that his victim's destiny was enforced. And that's exactly what it was. Destiny. If you became aware of your fate and tried to intervene, then chaos would rain down on you and the earth. This is why other gods were scared of Moros. Even though Zeus was extremely powerful, it's said that not even he could go against this destiny, and therefore Moros would have the ability to overpower Zeus in this way if he chose to. This power, along with the fact that he won't ever leave you alone, not even after you've died, is what makes me so fearful of Moros. Anything dark and dreadful that is said to happen in your life Life, Moros is at the hands of it and guiding you the entire way. Also, every visual representation of him I could find is very dark and reminds me of death. Just another reason why he's one of the scariest Greek gods that ever was. Kicking off at number five, Sekhmet. And this is the first time that we're heading down into the underbelly of ancient Egyptian mythology with one of its lesser known deities, but also perhaps its most violently ferocious. Now, it's no kept secret that the ancient Egyptians had a bit of a thing for death and disembowelment, but that particular torturous method of pain is best reserved for the legendary deity Sekhmet, the fiercest huntress amongst all of the Egyptian divinities. Sekhmet was often depicted as a lioness and she was bestowed upon the titles the one before whom evil trembles, mistress of the dead, lady of slaughter, and she who mauls. That's a pretty hefty resume, right? But nevertheless, she's a badass. Sekhmet was a solar deity and thus fell under the order of Ra, king of all the Egyptian gods. As the legend goes, Sekhmet was sent by Ra to kill a cabal of demons that were still lurking within the kingdom of Egypt, as well as their numerous mortal cults and secret orders who had instigated countless wars and other forms of discord upon mankind. Well, it turned out that Sekhmet had a thing for spilling blood, and with the first sign of battle, she fell into an animalistic frenzy, causing so much death, destruction, and bloodshed that the Nile itself overflowed in a crimson red. And because of her blood-based environmental disaster, Ra forced her to clean it up and swallow all of the blood in the Nile, subsequently kicking off a thousand year tradition of warriors getting punch drunk on red wine after every great battle. What a legacy. Swinging in at number four, Baron Samedi. And we're swinging over to the mythology of the lower of Haitian voodoo for this one, with perhaps their most infamous orchestrator of the dead, Baron Samedi. Now, although there are copious lower deities, the principal chief of the dead is this guy, who holds a certain chaotic reverence over the comings and goings of the living and the dead. Also known throughout his numerous incarnations as Baron Cimetière, Baron Lacroix, and Baron Criminel, Samadhi is often depicted dressed in a top hat with a black tailcoat, dark or lensless glasses, and cotton plugs in his nostrils, as if to resemble a corpse dressed and prepared for burial in the traditional Haitian style. He is brass, rude, fond of rum and tobacco, but also has a roguelike charm to him and an incredibly wild sense of humour. It is often said that the Baron Samedi spends most of his time in the invisible realm of voodoo, found at the mystical crossroads between the worlds of the living and the dead. For any soul that passes freely from this world, Baron Samedi has a freshly dug grave ready and waiting for them, and it's his business in ensuring that all corpses rot in the ground to stop any soul from being brought back as a brainless, flesh-hungry zombie. After all, it's an important job, and someone's got to do it. Cheers, Baron Samedi. Next up at number three, Rangda. Ah, yeah, how could we make this list without referencing perhaps the most evil force in the whole of the South Pacific, Rangda, the demon queen of the Layax. Now, in Balinese mythology, the Layax are a horrifying race of humanoid monstrosities that take the form of a grotesque flying head seeping with human entrails, the heart, the lungs, and the liver. In mythology, they were thought to be humans who had practiced black magic and cannibalism in the name of their queen, the widow witch Rangda. She often takes the form of a wretched, mostly nude old woman with a long tangle of hair, claws, fangs, and bulging red eyes. Rangda serves in direct opposition to the king of the spirits and leader of all the goodness in the world, Barong, and she eternally pits herself against him, orchestrating her army of evil witches and layaks to spread corruption, death, and destruction across the mythologies of Balan. Folklore. However, it is often thought that Rangda may also be closely associated with the Hindu goddess Durga, the fierce, often violent warrior mother that descends upon those that have wronged her with chaos and destruction. And because of that, Rangda is sometimes worshipped as a protectorate force in certain parts of Bali. Nevertheless, though, she is pretty damn terrifying. Next up at number two, Ishtar. Also known as Inanna, Ishtar is a fertility goddess of love and war, originally worshipped in ancient Mesopotamia and Sumer before gaining prevalence in Acadia. 
Babylon and Assyria, where she became their most beloved god, surpassing even their progenitor god, Ashur. It is often thought that Ishtar later influenced the Phoenician goddess Astarte, and thus later influenced the development of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, albeit a much more watered down version. Because let's not beat about the bush, Ishtar was super, super messed up. They say that there are two Eternals in creation, sex and death, and Ishtar encapsulated both of them. Whereas she was the goddess of love, she was also the goddess of war and chaos, so much so that in ancient Mesopotamia, the art of battle itself was often referred to as the dance of Inanna. As Ishtar's mythos developed across ancient civilization, her depiction of death and violence became much more prevalent, and she was gradually referenced as the progenitor of genocide, ultraviolence, cult-like worship of death, and the ritualistic sacrifice of children in her name. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Ishtar was the major antagonist in tempting Gilgamesh to submit to become her lover, which he refuses, and in turn Ishtar threatens to break into hell itself and unleash an entire army of the dead to feast upon the world. Yeah, Ishtar is not playing any games at all. And number one spot. Perchta, which is a figure that potentially ties neatly into our previous entry, Nick Nevin, and perhaps could even be tied into the same deity that was secretly worshipped across ancient Europe, a mysterious horned god often related to the goddess Diana, the natural deity of the moon, the hunt, and the wild. If you've never heard of the witch cult hypotheses, I definitely recommend reading up on it because it's incredibly interesting. But that's by the by, because what we're concerned with is one of its most terrifying depictions, Perchta, the arbiter of cultural taboos in Alpine paganism. In many in many instances, Perchta was given two forms, that of a beautiful young woman, white as snow, or as an elderly, haggard old crone who tempted children with bright red, poisonous apples. Hmm. Sound familiar? Perchta would roam the countryside and slip into homes during the dead of night, where she would find out if children and young servants of the household had been working hard all year, and if they had, they'd find a small silver coin by their bedside or in their shoe the next day. If they hadn't though, she would slit open their bellies, remove their stomachs and guts, and stuff the hole with straw and pebbles. Yeah. It is often thought though that Perchta permeated her way across the traditions of Old High German, taking many various forms and appearances. She was also thought to be the female mantle of Birchtold, a figure that was often tied to the mythical Wild Hunt, a band of mysterious demonic riders that have plagued the folklore of Europe and the British Isles for thousands of years, roaming the wild places of the world, doomed for eternity to hunt supernatural beasts and the dead. Come on guys, isn't mythology just great? Number 5. The Other Mother from Neil Gaiman's Coraline I might turn some heads for bringing this one up, but I will defend my choice with great fortitude. You might argue that the Other Mother is not a god, but I say she created her own world from scratch and ensured that every element was to Coraline's liking. What is a god if it is not creating or destroying worlds? Sure, she can only copy and warp what already exists in the real world, but she does quite a lot with that power alone. You might also say that the Other Mother couldn't stand toe to toe with other gods on this and other lists, but nowhere in the title does it say most powerful gods in literature. We're not looking at exclusively combat prowess or destructive power, although those are definitely factors. I'm going for the spook factor on this one. Sewing buttons into your eyes and abandoning the world you have known your whole life in favor of a mirror world, that's a scary proposition. Plus, when a person who looks just like your mother turns into a giant needle equipped spider who wants to trap you forever, you're gonna get scared. A lot of the other scary gods just don't have that personal touch when ruining everything you've ever loved. It's the thought that counts. Coming in at number four, we have Wero. Wero is the lord of darkness and evil in Maori. Wero is the lord of darkness and evil in Maori mythology. It is said that he lives in the underworld. According to some tribes, Wero brings bodies down to the underworld when they pass on, when he then consumes them. Eating these vessels gives him a greater strength. It is said that this will eventually give him enough power to break free of the underworld. If this was to ever happen, he would devour everyone and everything on earth. Some cultures believe that you must must be cremated when you pass on to prevent this from happening. Wero cannot gain strength from the ashes. Many people have lived in fear on Wero and would do anything to prevent him from breaking through to the mortal realm. 
It is said that Wero lives in a deep cave where he performs dark magic. He creates illness and disease to try and get as many vessels to consume as he can. He finds ways to release these illnesses onto the surface. He is one of the most active and feared gods of the underworld, and all associated with him are also feared. His biggest enemy is his brother Tain. Tain is the god of beauty and peace, and he looks over the forests and birds. He is a stark contrast to his brother. When his family grew frustrated of their confinement, they decided to separate. Wero wanted to stay in darkness, but Tain wanted the light. From this moment, they became enemies, with Wero hating everything that Tain loved and protected. Hopefully, Wero does not exist. He could be in the underworld gaining strength as we speak, waiting for this moment. Number three, Odium from Brandon Sanderson's The Stormlight Archive. I am emotion incarnate. I am the soul of the spren and of men. I am lust, joy, hatred, anger, and exaltation. I am glory and I am vice. I am the very thing that makes men, men. You picking up on a theme yet? Human traits are scary in an omnipotent being. We can't be trusted with that kind of power, why should they? One of the 16 shards, or pieces of the power of creation, Odium is a godlike being who has already killed others on his level. Following the Shattering, an event where the creator god was killed by 16 people, Odium was one of the shards that came to be. After ascending, he methodically sought out and killed four other shards, Devotion, Domination, ambition, and honor. A god that kills other gods is nothing to mess with. Some say that Odium is the wrath of a god, destroying all that dare to defy it. This is a pretty scary notion, as anyone who does anything outside of what Odium deems acceptable may be destroyed without a second thought. However, how Odium describes himself could be even more terrifying. He sees himself as passion, a shard of emotions, especially excessive emotions. Excessive emotions left unchecked can lead to highly destructive results. Whole worlds obliterated in the name of passion. Countless lives ended because of a disagreement between two individuals. Although there is a third and possibly more accurate description of Odium. Hatred. This seems to line up well with his actions and allows us to come closer to understanding his intent. With powerful magic like void light and void binding at his disposal, and an army of fuse at his beck and call, we do not want Odium giving in to passion or hatred. A whole lot could be at stake. Number 2. Diablo, the prime evil from Diablo. He is the root of all fears, buried deep within mortal minds. He is the nightmare that awakens us, sweating in the dark. He is an entity of pure malevolence and depthless evil. Diablo is so powerful, so capable of instilling terror, he is incapable of feeling fear. Now that is scary. Not that you could convince him that. I know that Diablo does not have roots in literature, but there are plenty of Diablo tomes floating around our earthbound world. In 2002's Diablo, Kingdom of Shadow, the prime evil attempts to open a passage between hell and sanctuary. If sanctuary isn't safe from hellfire, where is? He, as the most creative and far-sighted of the three prime evils, has a great capacity for cruelty on all planes he inhabits. Much like the Lovecraftian son of Azathoth, Nihilarhotep, Diablo sees himself as an artist of terror. He does not seek satisfaction in the form of conquest, but instead from the terror he instills in all of his victims. It could even be said that he's the embodiment of terror itself. Possessing powerful magical and physical capabilities once awoken, Diablo is an extremely dangerous being. Even if defeated or sealed away, there's always another way for the prime evil to make its way back into the waking world. Like a good horror movie villain, you can't keep Diablo down for long. Number 1, we've got the God Hand and the Idea of Evil from Berserk. Berserk is a manga that does not pull any punches. Extreme violence and sexual themes run throughout this long running series as it struggles with ideas ranging from isolation to camaraderie to the fundamental nature of human beings. Good and evil come up a lot, and no beings embody evil better than the God Hand. I'll group them all into one entity serving the idea of evil because that makes things a little more neat and tidy for the purpose of this list. Got a problem with it? <laughs> Make your own list. The God Hand consists of five members, representing all sorts of forces beyond our control. Fate, 
temptation, deception, famine, pestilence, gravity, and space. They rule over the human realm in servitude to the idea of evil and have had a hand in shaping many major events on Earth. They also look like Cenobites from the Hellraiser films, which definitely makes them a great degree scarier. As the most powerful demons, they reign over apostles and grant Beharit users reincarnation in exchange for a sacrifice. And that's part of what makes the God Hand so scary. The sacrifice. A major character in Berserk, Griffith, is gravely wounded at one point and unknowingly activates his Beharit during an eclipse. This brings him into the realm of the God Hand along with all of his comrades. Once there, the God Hand begin the reincarnation process with Griffith so that he may become reborn as one of them. However, this means that the people that mean the most to Griffith must be sacrificed. All of the members of the Band of Hawks are murdered and only two other major characters, Guts and Cass survive. The fact that five demons hold such power over all of humanity and are constantly looking for ways to add to their ranks is legitimately terrifying. What's even more scary though is that they're only the functional extension of an even higher power. The idea of evil. The idea of evil has been hypothesized as humanity's collective consciousness, finding a scapegoat for all the horror and atrocity in the world. If I hadn't already convinced you that humanity was actually the scariest thing of all, maybe the fact that humanity dreamed up a scapegoat so powerful that it gained sentience and started to change the course of world events will adjust your perspective. This concept, the idea of evil, was so powerful that even the creator of Berserk, Kentaro Miura, actually retconned it. After after originally writing it in. Mira stated that it limited his creative freedom and he wanted to ensure that God was left ambiguous. The idea of evil was too powerful for even the author to let slide, so we're just left with the God Hand. But that's still some pretty scary stuff. Kicking off at number five, the Morrigan. And may I add, this particular Celtic mythological deity is absolutely awesome in the heavy metal, death, and destruction kind of sense, as well as being one of the most interesting figures in the culture of the British Isles. The Morrigan, which is thought to have been derived from the proto Celtic as Morhio Gain, roughly translating to Great Queen, Phantom Queen, or Queen of Phantoms. She is mainly associated with war and fate, especially with the foretelling of doom, death, and victory in battle and through this role she is often depicted as a crow. For those that were fated to die in battle she would appear as a beautiful maiden beside a riverbank washing the bloodstained clothes of those awaiting death. The Morrigan is also often described as a trio of individuals, in particular three sisters who are oftentimes referred to as the three Morrigan. The Bad, the Maka and the Nyeman, representing each aspect of death, fate and glory in victory. In later folklore the Banshee was thought to be derivative of the Morrigan and in the Welsh Arthurian legend she was thought to be linked to the legendary Morgan Le Fay. In most respects the Morrigan is terrifying but she's also awesome. Coming in at number four Dionysus who fun fact was Jim Morrison's favorite Greek mythological figure probably because of all the wine because as we all know the man could sink his fair share of carafes. Nevertheless if you couldn't tell Dionysus was the god of grape harvest, wine making and wine of fertility, religious ecstasy and theater. Doesn't sound scary at all, right? Well, in actual fact, Dionysus was an incredibly horrifying deity, mainly due to his propensity to incite ritual madness and the fact that he had more cults worshipping him than you could shake an olive branch at. Now, don't get me wrong, Dionysus served an incredibly important role in the development of Greek culture and theatre, and for the most part, his ritualistic worship served as the main driving force of Greek enlightenment and spiritual liberation. However, it was the flip side of that coin that gave the rest of his worship a pretty bad name. Dionysus was often depicted as a dying and rising god and during one particular encounter with the Elder Titans his throat was slit, he was skinned alive and his flesh roasted and eaten for dinner. This led to a number of his female focused cults adapting the ritualistic sacrifice of tearing dissenters to pieces with their bare hands, mimicking the death of Dionysus and often resulting in cannibalism. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if that was the intended result. Swinging in at number three. Kali. I mean, you kind of only need to take one look at Kali and you'll realize how absolutely terrifying she actually is. Kali, also known as Kalika or Shiyama, is the Hindu goddess of time, creation, destruction, and power. And for the most part, she is perceived as the kindest and most loving of all the Hindu deities and is regarded by her devotees as the mother of the whole universe. She has an absolutely massive variety of forms, often appearing as a benevolent cloaked mother that protects her devotees and children from various mishaps and misfortunes. But because of this interpretation, 
mention of Kylie being a fierce protector of her children, it's kind of led to another pretty terrifying physical depiction, mainly in the form of her eternally clutching a severed head, which signifies the human ego being slain by divine knowledge, as well as the fact she often wears a skirt made of human arms and a garland of more human heads adorned happily around her neck. Kali is pretty much always shown with fiery red eyes intoxicated by the absolution of rage and is often shown standing atop of Shiva himself, clutching a multitude of blood-soaked swords in her numerous arms, asserting her complete and utter dominance over him and everything else in the universe. If you haven't figured out by now, it would not be wise to piss off Kali. Also, she travels around on her pet lion, so yeah, you've been warned. Coming in at number two, Nurgle. And we're heading way, way back to ancient Mesopotamia, to the lands of Akkad, Assyria, and Babylonia, where this guy ruled with an iron fist. Also known as Era or Era, Nurgle is the ravenous god of war, plague, death, and disease, and collected titles such as the Furious One and the Raging King. But to be honest, Nurgle was so ridiculously powerful that he only ever weighs war out of pure boredom. Initially, Nurgle was the god of war, often drawn as a proto form of Ares in Greek mythology, but in later stages, he also became the god of death and the underworld. And how did he do that? He literally stormed the gates of the land of the dead with a small army of demons and took over the place by force. Well, I guess that's one way to do it. In another myth involving Nurgle, one day he was feeling dull and bored, and so to spice things up a bit, he decided to just straight up attack the great city of Babylon, which was then under the protection of Marduk, the most powerful of all ancient Mesopotamian gods. Through trickery and deceit, Nurgle managed to distract Marduk long enough to completely slaughter the innocent citizens of Babylon, and once his bloodlust was sated, he reassured the survivors that a great leader would soon return to protect them, so they needn't worry about dying. What the hell, dude? Talk about mind games. Yeah, out of pretty much all of the gods in mythology, this guy was the personification of watching the world burn just for the sake of it. And finally, our number one spot, Zeus. I'm going to preface this point with one simple statement. Zeus is messed up. Man, and it kind of comes with the territory when you take a look at this guy's origin and the fact that his titan slash father Cronus ate all of his children alive after chopping off his own father's genitalia and throwing it in the ocean after fearing that the same thing would happen to him. Yeah. The exception being Zeus himself who was hidden in a cave by his mother and replaced with a rock who then broke all of his siblings out by slashing open his titan father's stomach, freeing them to reign back across the planet and becoming the king of the gods of Mount Olympus that we all know today. Also, despite the fact that Zeus pretty much roamed around for the rest of existence, fornicating with everything that moved, his own sisters slash wives included, he was also just straight up out of order when it came to humanity. In the legend of Prometheus, the demigod took one look at humanity down below and thought, those guys look pretty cold, let's give them some fire. And what was Zeus's response? He was so mad that he chained Prometheus to a rock where an eagle would swoop down every day to gorge at his liver, which would then later regenerate fraternity. Also, in the whole Pandora's box incident, it was completely Zeus's fault, although he never gets to blame. He himself blessed Pandora with insatiable curiosity to beguile humanity, and then gave her a box, and then told her to never open that box. He knew exactly what would happen, and everyone blamed Pandora. Told you he was messed up. Coming in at number five, we have Nyarlathotep, to quote H.P. Lovecraft. And where Nyarlathotep went, rest vanished, with small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Nyarlathotep, known to many by his epithet, the Crawling Chaos, is an outer god in the Cthulhu mythos. He is the spawn of Azathoth, and first appeared in his prose poem, Nyarlathotep, back in 1920. A quote from the dreams in the witch house goes as follows. A tall, lean man of dead black coloration, wholly devoid of either hair or bear and wearing as his only garment a shapeless robe of some heavy black fabric. His feet were indistinguishable because of the table and bench, but he must have been shod since there was a clicking whenever he changed position. The man did not speak and bore no trace of expression on his small, regular features. He merely pointed to a book of prodigious size which lay upon the table. Nyarlathotep differs from other deities in the mythos in a number of ways. Most of the outer gods are exiled to the stars like Yogg-Sothoth and Azathoth. 
And most of the great old ones are sleeping and dreaming like Cthulhu. Nyarlathotep, however, is active and frequently walks the earth in the guise of a human being, usually a tall, slim, joyous man. Nyarlathotep enacts the will of the outer gods and is their messenger, heart and soul, the immurial figure of the deputy or messenger of hidden and terrible powers. He is also the servant of Azathoth, whose fitful wishes he fulfills. Unlike the other outer gods, spreading madness is more important and enjoyable than death and destruction to Nyarlathotep. It is also suggested by some that he will destroy the human race and possibly the earth as well. Number four on this list is Apate. Apate is the daughter of Erebus, the god of darkness, and Nyx, the god of the night. She is also the sister to Moros, who will get into later in this video. Unlike her parents, she didn't represent darkness or the night, but she represented deceit, lies, deception, fraud. These were all things that Apate excelled at. Being the goddess of deceit, naturally she took an insane amount of pride in lying to others and tricking them. It wasn't enough to just pull the wool over somebody's eyes though, she wanted to ruin people's lives and loved whenever she did it. I'm going to read off one story that exemplifies the type of trickery that I'm talking about. This comes from the website Greek Gods and Goddesses. In one story involving Apate, Hera, the wife of Zeus, learned about her husband's affair with the Theban princess Semel and looked to Apate for help in punishing the princess. To make matters worse, the princess had a child by Zeus named Dionysus who would become the god of wine. Apate agreed to help and gave Hera a magical girdle which she used to trick Semel into asking Zeus to see his real self and the princess died as a result. Whenever the gods approached humans, they would appear as something else and hide their true forms because no mere mortal could survive looking directly at a god. This is the type of stuff that Apate would do. Trick somebody into watching as the person they were romantically involved with dies right before their eyes. Evil things that would haunt people's dreams for the rest of their lives. It's one thing to be all powerful and outright to be able to beat you in a fight, and I'm definitely scared of gods like that, but at least I know with gods like that that I'm beat. With a god like Apate, you won't even know that you're in the fight until it's too late. At any point, she could trick you and damn your soul to hell for eternity. Not the type of person that you'd want to have an interaction with. Coming in at number three, Shabnagarath. Shabnagarath is an outer god in the Cthulhu mythos of H.P. Lovecraft. The being first appeared in Lovecraft's revision story, The Last Test, back in 1928. However, in Lovecraft's work, she is never actually described, but is frequently mentioned or called upon in incantations. Shabnagarath also appears in the works of other authors, including August Derleth, Lynn Carter, and Brian Lumley. Shabnagarath is an outer god or outer goddess in the pantheon. She is a perverse fertility deity, said to appear as an evil cloud-like entity, as written by H.P. Lovecraft in selected letters. She is said to be an enormous mass, which extrudes black tentacles, slime-dripping mouths, and short, writhing goat legs. Small creatures are continually spat forth by the monstrosity, which are either consumed into the miasmatic form, or escape to some monstrous life elsewhere. Of all the mythos deities, Shabnagarath is probably the most worshipped. Her followers include the Hyperboreans, the Movians, and the people of Sarnath, as well as any number of Druidic and Barbaric cults. Shabnagarath is believed to have mated with Haster to produce the beings Zar, Ithaca, and Jezahar. Haster may also be the father of her thousand young or dark young, though there is a good chance they were spawned by fission. Now, she has also appeared outside of the world of Lovecraft. Both Stephen King and Terry Pratchett have referenced Shabnagarath in their works. Coming in at number two, Yogg-Sothoth. To quote H.P. Lovecraft in the Dunwich Horror, Yogg-Sothoth knows the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yogg-Sothoth. He knows where the old ones broke through of old, and where they shall break through again. He knows where they have trod Earth's fields, and where they still tread them, and why no one can behold them as they tread. Yogg-Sothoth is a cosmic entity and outer god, born of the nameless mist. He is the progenitor of Cthulhu, Hastur the Unspeakable, and the ancestor of Vormi. Like many Lovecraftian gods, Yogg-Sothoth has many different appearances throughout the various stories of the mythos, by various authors. There is, however, a common agreement that Yogg-Sothoth visually manifests as a mass of glowing orbs, with eyes or tendrils in some versions, and in others simply the orbs. It is also heavily implied that Yogg-Sothoth is omniscient, and is locked outside the universe, meaning he can know and see all of space-time all at once, which means there is no secret hidden from Yogg-Sothoth. Outside of the work of H.P. Lovecraft, Yogg-Sothoth also appears in Doctor Who as the military strategist of the Great Old Ones, who are the equivalent of the Time Lords in a 
previous universe. And finally, coming in at number one, Azathoth. To quote H.P. Lovecraft in the dream quest of Unknown Kedath, outside the ordered universe is that amorphous blight of nethermost confusion, which blasphemies and bubbles at the center of all infinity. The boundless daemon Sultan Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud, and who gnaws hungrily in inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time and space amidst the muffled, maddening beating of vile drums and the thin, monotonous whine of accursed flutes. Azathoth, sometimes called the blind idiot god, and the nuclear chaos and the deep dark is an outer god with no definite description, simply because everybody envisions him differently, and he is constantly changing. There is evidence the physical manifestation of Azathoth in the universe is continuous with a spot in the central region of the galaxy, otherwise known as Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Azathoth is a significant malign presence in the Necronomicon, as both Albert Wilmarth and Walter Gilman are horrified at the mim mention of its name, having both read about it in the occult tome. In Gilman's case, it's the witch Keziah Mason who references Azathoth while haunting his dreams, stating, he must meet the black man and go with them all to the throne of Azathoth at the center of the ultimate chaos. He must sign in his own blood the Book of Azathoth and take a new secret name. What kept him from going with her to the throne of chaos where the thin flutes pipe mindlessly was the fact that he had seen the name Azathoth in the Necronomicon and knew it stood for a primal horror too horrible for description. Kicking off at number five, Tash, Chronicles of Narnia. And no, not Natasha, but Tash. Tash the inexorable, Tash the irresistible, the patron god of the ruling class of Calamon, essentially the best friend and overseer of the rich who gobbles up poor people and the working class just for the sheer fun of it to further fuel his dark and manipulative reign. Now, if you know anything about C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, then you'll certainly know that this particular fantasy series draws its main body of inspiration from the Judeo-Christian religion. And whereas the bold and brave lion himself, Aslan, represents Jesus, while as you may imagine, Tash represents the pure and evil antithesis of that, the Antichrist. And yes, say what you will about the Chronicles of Narnia, and whether you think it's tame or not comparable to some later fiction found here, the truth of the matter is Tash is pretty damn terrifying. And he's the purveyor of some pretty horrendous themes throughout the series of what is essentially a children's novel. Tash appears as a dark and shadowy demon, an almost skeletal figure of a humanoid body with a vulture-like head and four grotesque taloned arms. His presence is said to bring with it the cold, and his stench is that of death. And yet, whilst many people in the world of Narnia refuse to believe in Tash, he is very much a real and evil entity. Now, strangely enough, although being the pure antithesis of Aslan, one of Narnia's most prolific figures, Tash appears only twice in this series, and in 1954's The Horse and His Boy, and in 1956's The Last Battle. In the former, he's referred to in the same passage as two other gods, Azeroth, hmm, where have we heard that name before, and Zardina, the Lady of the Night and the Maidens. And yet still, comparable to those two, Tash is still the only figure that the fanatical people of Calamon would like to sacrifice children to in his name. Yeah, that's pretty much the extent of it, really. At one point, the followers of Tash tried to run a smear campaign against Aslan by suggesting that Tash and Aslan were the same entity, conveniently called Tashlan. Yeah, obviously they didn't buy the fact, given the fact that Tash is very clearly a giant, terrifying, bird-headed primeval stray from some Assyrian cultist mythology. Hey. It was a simpler time. In at number four, we have Eris. The daughter of Zeus and Hera, Eris was the goddess of strife and discord. Thus, Eris's only purpose was to seek out discord among gods and humans. This goddess is one of the scariest mythical gods in history solely because she could erupt the smallest arguments into more serious events, including war. Eris easily caused division between friends, humans, and married couples, causing what she loved most discourse. Additionally, it was often described that Eris would often be found on the battlefield, being delighted in the pain and suffering of soldiers, and was also known as the goddess of the battlefield and the deity who stirred men to fight and kill each other. Due to Eris's disagreeable nature, she was the only goddess not invited to the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. That being said, she showed up anyways and raged at the event, and threw a golden apple amongst the goddesses inscribed to the fairest. Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena laid claim to the apple, creating a rivalry between the three goddesses. And eventually, this rivalry brought the events leading up to the Trojan War. Being the god of chaos, she was at the heart of every disagreement and argument in ancient Greece. Eris represented a host of negative emotions and reactions that most people hope to avoid entirely. She sowed discord between gods and mortals, spurring them into fights and war for their own enjoyment. Eris delighted in people's unhappiness and when chaos ensued around her. Even though the Greeks did not like Eris, she still played a significant role in their lives as all arguments, small or big, began with her. And most of all, Eris embodied the strife of war. Therefore, for her enjoyment 
of other people's misery and ability to start one of the biggest wars in Greek mythology, she has a spot on our list. Handle. Next up at number three, Morgoth, the Lord of the Rings. Of course, we can't really talk about terrifying godlike entities in fantasy and horror fiction without first addressing perhaps the OG of Dark Lords of Fantasy incarnate. Morgoth Bauglir, or Melkor, depending on which point in his life you familiarise yourself with him. Because as we all know, even Dark Lords of Chaos and Shadow have a story. And we should respect that, even if it is full of betrayal and terror and evil of all sorts of machinations. Now, if you know anything about the vast and flowing mythology penned by Tolkien in both The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion, as well as many other works of fiction, then you'll know that Eru Iluvatar, the creator of all things Ea and Arda included, also created the entities of the Aenor to live within it. In the void of nothingness, he gave life to these angelic beings, and Melkor was the most powerful of them all. However, dissatisfied that Eru had abandoned the void, Melkor grew curious enough to seek to emulate his own creator in an attempt to fill the void with sentient beings. For this though, Melkor would need the secret fire, and that was impossible for him to find. To combat that, Melkor sought to create his own discordant melodies in the music of the Aenor, the fabric of creation that forms the basis for the themes of all things, and because of that, Melkor introduced the first music of chaos, the same disharmonies that were responsible for all later evil in Arda. Well, obviously, eventually the will to exceed his creator's power turned Melkor into a violent and twisted image of himself, and as the sentient races of Arda began to emerge, his desire to conquer and overthrow contorted him into Morgoth, the entity responsible for the orcs, Ungoliant, and all the spiders, werewolves, balrogs, revenants, and the darkness in the hearts of men. This guy burned down world trees like it was going out of fashion. You see, it's hard to gauge just exactly where the veracity of Morgoth lies, because in the truest sense of the word, you cannot get more evil than Morgoth. And then, of course, there's the emergence of the Cult of Melkor, headed by the Lieutenant of Evil himself, the Dark Lord Sauron, where here, as the High Priest of that cult, Sauron orchestrated the human sacrifice of the Numenors in Melkor's name, and then pride cometh before the fall and all that. Morgoth, guys, he's got a mace called Grond that was literally forged from the essence of the underworld. I would not like to meet him in a tavern. Put it that way. Coming in at number two, Randall Thor, the Wheel of Time. All right, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently with this particular point because by rights, in terms of power level, this guy should probably take the number one spot on pretty much every literature list ever written. However, what sets this entry apart, as those of you who have read the Wheel of Time series will know, is that Randall Thor is kind of the good guy. I mean, he is the good guy. He's the personification of light and righteous flames, but he can also kind of destroy the fabric of all reality without breaking a sweat. The reason Randall Thor is ranking so high here on the terrifying meter is that if this guy was on the wrong side, we'd be done so. I mean, it's a good thing that he wasn't or isn't. Rand is very clearly the main protagonist of Robert Jordan's phenomenal fantasy series. But guys, really, the Dragon Reborn would cover the entire Earth in a blanket of cleansing fire in a single moment if he ever wished to do so. And that makes him terrifying. He's Superman meets Dr. Manhattan on a biblical scale. As written in Keeper of the Chronicles, he is born again. I feel him. The dragon takes his first breath on the slopes of Dragon Mount. He is coming. Light help us. Light help the world. He lies in the snow and cries like the thunder. He burns like the sun. I mean, I know he's good and he's going to save the day and everything, but that's terrifying, guys. Born in the year 978 of the New Earth, Rand is the most central of the three protagonists that make up the series. And really, guys, if you haven't, then Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series needs your attention. It's awesome. And it's with themes like this that gives it reason alone to stand out as such a remarkable work of literature. I'll try and avoid as many spoilers as possible, and this entry is kind of a spoiler alone. But if the thought of the root of all goodness and light in the world is also a source of unbridled terror and overwhelming fear, then yeah, this series is certainly for you. I'm just really, really glad that Rand is, uh, is one of the good guys. Thanks. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the crippled god, Malazan. And as so far as overwhelmingly powerful entities being the source of all of this terror, then we don't have to preface it with the willy or won't he ways of Rand Thor, because instead we can pin it all on one of the most potentially destructive forces ever found in fiction. The crippled god, the chained one, the death slayer, and the king of change. Really, we'll try and do this one without spoilers, because Malazan Book of the Fallen is an absolutely astounding fantasy series. And if you haven't yet had a chance to check it out, then please check it out. And also, the audiobooks are really well done. So there's another reason too if you've got a long commute. Although there are a lot of characters to keep track of, so if that's not your kind of thing, actually no, just read it regardless. Anyway, the Malazan series encompasses many differing woven series featuring gods and mortals, alien entities, pretty much everything going. All of them though pale in comparison to the crippled god. And yet thankfully for everyone, this guy is chained and imprisoned, so he can't hurt anyone at all. 
sure those chains will hold, right? You see, throughout the series, the crippled god often appears as a frail, bent figure, wrapped and hooded in rags and blankets, often inhabiting a dilapidated, sun-bleached tent found along a sandy beach upon an endless shore. Usually, he is found huddled over a smoking brazier, speaking in a raspy voice, intermingled by hacking coughs and laboured breathing. He has long tangled hair and all of his fingers and his thin mangled hands are broken and shattered. He weeps and moans in his constant agony and he constantly throws seas into the brazier before him to further the wafting smoke that he emerges from. <sighs> really guys, I know it's quite a bit of a cop out but we can't get into the bulk of the Crippled God without any spoilers. But if that initial appearance is curiosity enough to pique your interest, then believe me, as far as the Crippled God is concerned, there is far more to be discovered, at your own risk, of course. The crippled god knows only suffering and his only desire is to make all others feel the same. Well there we have it folks, our list for the top 5 most terrifying gods in literature. What do you guys think? Do you agree? Disagree? Have any more to add to this list? Then let us know your thoughts down in the comment section below, as well as any choice picks of your own. Before we depart from today's video though, let's first take a quick look at some of your more creative comments from over the past few days. First up, Brett Hazelton says, How does a Russian corpse from before 1855 know about atoms? Dude! Lucifer and Democritus were talking about atomic theory back in like 460 BC. Epicurus was blowing everyone's mind with the theorized collision of atoms. Thought it was even cool. That's how atoms have been theorized to exist long before they actually were, which is an awesome fact regardless. So, who knew, eh? Next up, Mark Rush says, too much talking. Ah, guess I'll shut up then, Mark. And on that note, unfortunately that's all we've got time for in today's video. Should stick around all the way until the end. If you were a fan of this video or just top 5 scary videos in general, then please be a dear and hit that thumbs up button. As well as that subscribe button. And I'll be seeing you in the next one. As per usual, I've been your horror host Jack Finch. You've been watching top 5 scary videos. And until next time, you take it easy.